Yes, we can move on to our second uh, speaker for today. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Oz Ataman uh, uh, to, 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 our, to our meetup group. Oz is the CEO of Sustone, where he's been innovating, let me read, where, where, where we've, been, we've been intensive commercial users of Haskell for the past 10 years, focusing on production applications around machine learning, business optimization, and analytics. Uh, today, he's going to be talking about supercharging data with SQL and Haskell. Over to you, Oz. All right. Well, just like Gabriella said, thanks a lot for, uh, for the invitation. Um, this is actually a topic that we've been meaning to publicize for a while now, and it this just seemed like the perfect opportunity to start doing that. Um, and by the way, um, I think I've, I've spent most of my brain power for the day <laughs> following Gabriella's presentation, so I'll need to take a deep breath and, and sort of adjust to a different topic here. Um, so, um, all right, I think I'll dive in and, and we'll see how this goes. Um, and by the way, if there's any questions, please just keep writing in, in the Twitch chat. I don't know how good I'll be at keeping uh, up with them, but I'll try to catch them and maybe squeeze in the answers as I, as I go through. Um, all right, so maybe just to give you guys a little bit of an orientation, um, a bit about, I guess, uh, myself, uh, so I've been uh, focused on, you know, engineering for the benefit of very practical real, real world applications for a while now. Um, it's kind of crazy that uh, it's already been 14 years or so with Haskell. And as you might imagine, pretty much all the other languages you, you get to touch over the years. Um, I founded Sue Stone about 10 years ago. We've been using Haskell quite heavily. Uh, pretty much everything we do in production, which is something like web APIs, database interactions, you know, DSLs of various kinds, um, actually exactly like, um, like Gabriella uh, described, you know, the intuition is when you run into problems where you feel like you could have a language expressing them, you sort of tap that, um, you know, tap that opportunity. Um, and then we do a lot of database applications. So a lot of machine learning, a lot of Bayesian model types of um, efforts, uh, and, you know, try to open source whenever we could. Um, I think we have a few libraries that um, ended up being useful, um, such as Retry, Cat of a logging library, and a few other things like that. Um, and ultimately, we we constantly work with data, um, which is kind of odd because we're, we're certainly a, a really sizable part, sort of a data science type of team, you know, trying to further uh, various machine learning style real world applications. Um, it just so happens that we love Haskell um, for the production basis of, of all that work. Um, and then I'll just mention, I've been spending the last, you know, I would say four or five years constantly worrying about, you know, how do you preserve high power to weight ratio in software uh, engineering and, and sort of quality of the code base um, while you still, you know, let's say you scale the team and um, you're more than just, you know, one or two people. Um, this is a real hard problem um, and it's been keeping me pretty busy. Um, okay, so our topic for today um, is introducing a new tool called Napkin that we've actually been working on since 2015. So another crazy fact that it's been six, seven years already, uh, but we finally polished it up and, and made it ready for prime time, if you will, to, to share with the world. Um, and to be blunt about it, this is actually a tool that's meant for much more than the Haskell community. Um, in fact, we're almost de-emphasizing the fact that it's done in Haskell because we want it to look friendly and comfortable for data science and data engineering, data analysis uh, types of communities. But if you happen to be a Haskeller, it gives you sort of power user access, if you will. <laughs> you can do a lot more with it. Um, you know, we've spent a lot of time building some documentation for it. Um, so here are a couple of links. Um, I'm sure we'll post these around as well. Um, and a little bit of transparency. Our intent is to make Napkin free. So, you know, it's, it's forever going to be free. Um, it's totally feature rich in its own. Now we do ask ourselves, you know, maybe we should build some, you know, commercial um, web app type of layer on top that would do things for, you know, teams and professional, um, you know, circumstances, but it wouldn't even duplicate functionality. It would just be new things that matter to those contexts. So the core idea here is here's a really great tool. We've used it for many years in production now. Um, you know, hopefully the world will like it as well. All right. So what I'll do here is, of course, this is a Haskell meetup. Um, so I'll try to uh, sort of show under the cover a little bit um, and, and describe why, you know, what tricks we used in Haskell and why it ended up being so useful and so on. Um, all right. So first off, obviously not everybody, you know, might, might work in data all the time. So let me try to motivate the problem a little bit. Um, 
so if you're if you're the kind of person or team uh, working with data, the, the, there's a fundamental challenge that everybody runs into, which is you've got your systems that that spit out raw data sets, right? So um, you know sales transactions, member activity, event streams, log streams, you know web click stream. You know these are all very raw levels of data, and and you have usually pretty high volumes of this, um, and they keep coming in. Yet the analysis you want to do tend to be at a higher level of aggregation. So you kind of need to aggregate these up, maybe filter them, maybe facet them, uh, you know, maybe connect them to something like Tableau or ClickView or some fancy dashboarding application. Um, and ultimately, you can't just use the raw data directly. Um, you know, you can't just, hey, let me whip open a Python notebook, load you know twenty three terabytes of data into my Python uh, notebook into a pandas data frame. Uh, and then just you know just do some filters. You know, it, it's 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 ludicrous. It just won't work. So on the left, you see an example, a real snapshot. Uh, we tried to give away nothing confidential, and hopefully succeeded in that. But this is a data set that's very real. We can see the timestamps and so on, and we've got forty billion rows of data in there. Um, so pretty uh, you know pretty daunting challenge. Um, and to give you a bit more of an idea as to what really happens. And part of my intent is also that if, if in your work, if you ever run into a data set that's sort of tab tabular in nature, you know, this might even act as a super high level introduction to you know, how one deals with that. So you usually start with um, you know, really raw data as the first step. Sometimes you'll have a couple of main tables and that'll be it. Um, you're gonna have hundreds of columns, um, more and more actually, it's very convenient to just jam JSON blobs in the table, uh, you know, worrying about unpacking it later. Um, and then usually what you want to do is kind of transform it into a bunch of aggregations, you know, maybe pre-roll them up to, to um, you know, certain group buys, uh, maybe filter. A lot of times between step one and two, you'll do like data enrichment. So you'll take the data you already have, and then you'll merge into it through, you know, good old fashioned joins, um, additional facts. Maybe you'll, you'll have some formulas you want to compute up one time at the early parts of this process. So you're downstream users don't have to keep repeating the same formula. So anyways, you'll do that and you'll find yourself with tens of these intermediate tables um, that usually have fewer rows. You've tried to simplify the problem a little bit. You might still have millions of rows, by the way, but sometimes you'll get down to thousands of rows. Um, and then ultimately, some of these tables will be clean and structured enough that um, you know they can act as the basis for final usage of the data, if you will. So now, this could be anything. This could be fancy dashboards on, on something like Tableau. It could be uh, your super uh, great, crazy Bayesian model that'll do some kind of special inference. Um, it could be, you know, pumped into some kind of API, whatever, right? Um, so that's a, that's a fairly, you know, typical topology. Of course, the interesting thing is sometimes step three will also connect back into step one. So, you know, your algorithm will produce new data and then you'll, you'll want to pump that back into your pipeline. So it's not quite linear, actually. There might be some some loops forming uh, in this type of thing. Um, okay, so the, a little bit of a, a history. Hopefully, this will be a fun walkthrough. I won't spend a ton of time, but again, I think it's interesting to motivate the problem. So we've been dealing with this for um, quite some time now, and um, you know we you know we've had a lot of attempts, but you know, let me maybe maybe pick one as the the first real attempt. So we. We said, all right, we've got all this data. Let's use Hadoop MapReduce. And it's meant to scale up to hundreds of servers, and you know you can express your transformations in code, uh, um, be great engineers, and um, get you know have a good solution to this. And in fact, back in 2014, we made a library for this to 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 help um, do this in Haskell called Hadron. It's still up there; um, has been unmaintained for quite some time. And we even made a presentation about this, by the way. So if you, I guess, Google it, you would find it. Um, and it was absolutely, uh, you know, delightful and very cool. So we we came up with this idea that hey, maybe we can use free monads, where you express your chain of transformations, and then each transformation knows where it reads the data and where it places the output data. And then, as you can see on the left in, in types here, you know, it's sort of you know all the map reduce options are baked into the particular step. Um, I define a mapping function. I define a reducing function. You can see that you know the the type parameters are there and nice. So you know the output of one gets ingested by the input of the other, right? So that you got the you get the usual Haskell type safety, and then we had this idea of of taps and protocols. So we said, well, you know, data tends to be in different formats. So let's have this idea of a protocol. Um, ultimately, 
as long as you can give me, you can somehow parse the data I need into the form I need, um, then I don't care what format it's in. So we could abstract over, you know, is it a JSON file, CSV file, some protocol buffer thing? Uh, it sort of like captured all of that, um, which was which was fairly nice. And this thing actually worked um, really well. So, you know, yeah, I'm basically digging up some old code that we don't use anymore. Um, so on the on the on the left, you kind of see one MapReduce step, right? So it was very uh, very typical Haskell like. So you could define your MapReduce step, had really nice types. Um, you could you know set its options like is there compression? How do I partition? Um, if you know MapReduce a little bit, there's this idea of you know partitions and how you do group bys and so on. So you could use your custom um, types for the problem domain. You know I guess in this particular problem we had the idea of the quote I guess and you know, days and base products and so on. So you could see all that in mapper types, um, right? I think we ended up using the conduit library at the time for whatever reason. Um, uh, sorry that we didn't use pipes, I guess, uh, Gabriella. <laughs> but, uh, um, it, you know, basically you sort of express it nicely in, uh, you know, in sort of in Haskell and get a lot of type safety out of this. And then on the right, the free monads gave you that flexibility to really chain all these things in a, in a program. So. Um, if you if you wanted to do MapReduce yourself, um, you know you, you had to be very careful about connecting these dots. And you know now, even back then, there were libraries that helped you with this in Python and some other places. Uh, I'm sure today the state of the art must be much further advanced. But at the time, this was actually a meaningful um, you know sort of convenience. You could actually say, "All right, do this step, do this step, do this step," and you could just connect them, and then the framework just handled everything for you. In fact. It also did some hacks. So the same same free monad based computation could be interpreted in orchestrating mode where it would basically say, oh, okay, so I see the step. So I'm going to issue commands to my, you know, 100 servers actually doing the work. So I'm going to spit out a bunch of commands to my mappers, um, you know, get things started. And, then, and it just all worked. Um, and this was pretty nice. But the fundamental problem was it was still way too slow. You know, if you're, if you're, uh, if you're, let's say, a data science uh, kind of shop, um, and if you do enough uh, sort of varied work, what tends to happen is you run into new data sets all the time. Um, your existing data sets experience changes in shape all the time. And actually, importantly, you yourself keep enriching your own data set. So even if you start with the same source data, you come up with additional ways constantly um, to, to make changes on the data structure. So in some sense, if every time you needed to innovate something in your data pipeline, if you had to go into you know sort of this kind of specialized Haskell and really tuned everything just right and did this massive MapReduce job and get some feedback, I mean it worked, but it certainly didn't make you an amazingly fast team. Probably faster than many of the others trying to do this without Haskell at the time, um, but but it sort of left something to be desired. So that leads me into my, into our second semi-failed idea, because this actually was the hint at the right idea, uh, which was basically under tremendous time pressure, um, we had to deal uh, with, a, with a pretty, uh, you know, basically a new business case, lots of data, and we need to make a lot happen. And right around then, we were noticing that um, analytics databases were getting very strong. So, um, you know, databases like Redshift, BigQuery, Snowflake, and now there's many others, um, you know, had started popping up and they were these columnar stores, which made it so that you could take a 200 column data set, you know, jam it into this database, and then it could have literally 5 billion rows and it still ran like counts and all kinds of more complex aggregations on top of that, like really, really fast. Whereas this was never an option before these things came about because you just instinct instinct instinctively knew that if you loaded this in like Postgres, you know, good old fashioned Postgres, and then, you know, wrote your SQL query with like three common table expressions and, you know, a bunch of aggregations and then nested aggregations and things like that. I mean, you would literally run it on a 20 million data set and come back in 10 hours and it would still be running. Like it was just way too slow. And so these databases really solved that problem. So we had this idea, of, okay, forget about MapReduce for this project where we need to move fast. What if we just jammed the data into these databases as raw data, and then we just wrote SQL. And then whenever a single SQL query is too hard to do the, the job in one shot, what if we just wrote SQL that produced an intermediate data set and then wrote another you know, SQL query that would build on that to create a new data set 
and then have another one that may be built on that to make another one. And then, you know, off it goes, you get sort of this idea that, you know, if Redshift BigQuery are really so good at dealing with large amounts of data, well, great, let's lean on that. So let's just write SQL, turn everything into SQL um, and, uh, and build our analyses that way. And as long as I can refresh all my SQL queries in, in the right order, this should work. Uh, obviously, we're not the only ones that had this idea, but um, you know, certainly this was back when these ideas were coming back. You know, I think this kind of an ETL approach perhaps was popular many, many years ago before MapReduce, but now it was just coming back. Um, so, um, you know, there's an interesting comment I would make there where um, SQL as a language is surprisingly pleasant, I think, for a Haskell mindset because, um, you know, it's not quite full Haskell, so it doesn't have modularity. You can't like program it and build bigger pieces from smaller pieces. It's terrible for that. But it does have this declarative nature where it gives you the feeling that once it, let's say, compiles and you've QA'd it, right? It has a few rough corners. Like it just works. It doesn't, you know, it, it, it sort of is very self-contained. You can look at a query and you know exactly what it's doing. It doesn't have any side effects, right? It doesn't have any like global effects or anything. It's actually kind of local in what it does. Um, now its inputs might change and that might blow up on you, but so it's not perfect, but there's something there that feels very Haskell-like um, in spirit. So back then what we did is, all right, well, we still have a big project to do and we just, you know, we can't just manually run stuff against the database and not, not, you know, we're obviously, we need to source control this thing. We need to make it repeatable. So we just did a super fast hack. We said, all right, let's do some quasi quoting in Haskell. You know, what if we just wrote like actual SQL but I need to punch a little heavier. Like I don't want to type the same query 10 times with minor variations. I need to program the query a little bit. So I'm going to do the dumbest thing I could imagine. I'm just going to do quasi coding given some, some very basic sort of inputs. I'm just going to do string manipulation, <laughs> right? So we, uh, so we did this. Um, it allowed us to move really fast. Um, it requires you to know SQL really well, which you know I did and others did. Um, and so, you know, we did it and it actually works pretty well. Now it doesn't really scale because it, it leaves a lot to be desired. So for example, you know, it's, it's only, you can only manipulate this SQL query based on the sort of holes you left in it in the first place. You know, you can't sort of analyze it. You can't look at what table it's running on. You can't write it and say, oh, actually, what if we ran that exact same query, but just had it use a different table as its source? Because I'm trying a new idea I just want to swap it's like from uh, from thing, but I don't want to like recall this thing because I made a bunch of previous edits on it and so on. All those things are are impossible. It's just the simplest form of like variable substitution type of abstraction. Um, so it worked, but left a lot to be desired. And then there was the the second question where once once you start doing this, um, well, you spin up a lot of tables. So now you're asking, well, how do I refresh these things? Um, you know, how do I make sure they're refreshed in the right order? An easy way to do that is always refresh the entire pipeline. So literally, let's say you made a change in your code, you're trying a different logic for your analysis, just to be sure there are no stale data leftovers, you would literally say refresh everything. So delete all the tables and then start from the beginning and like refresh the whole thing, which works just fine when you have like three tables. But as you get to like 20, 25 tables, it's just, it's horrible. You, you wanna be able to just surgically refresh one table, but also know that if that's refreshed, then it's downstream. Um, sort of impact area also gets refreshed and so on. So essentially this project, I, I remember distinctly left me thinking, man, there's really, I think we should probably make a library for this and just do this a lot better. Um, but there was a pretty big revelation at the time for me. Uh, again, I'm sure others had it too, but but this was our, our own way of discovering it uh, by ourselves. It was like, interesting, you know, th this is so convenient. You know, you get this sort of regenerative pipeline where, as long as your, your, your source data remains in a table, completely immutable, you never mutate it, it's, it's just there. And then you can build these steps of transformations using SQL as your language. Um, and then these modern databases are so freaking strong that you, know, you, you now have a data solution for a thousand rows, for a million rows, and for you know, 10 billion rows. I mean, that feels really good because you feel very empowered. You know, you basically don't see your data anymore. Any size, you're happy to deal with, no problem. Um, so um, that led into basically today's today's main topic, which is a tool we created called Napkin. Uh, 
the original idea came from, you know, it's sort of a back of the napkin calculation. <laughs> um, so, so that's, that's where I guess the, the idea for the library name came from. Um, but so, you know, the short of it is like, what if, um, what if we can have an actual Haskell ASD uh, that could, you know, express SQL queries. So you could, you know, program in it if you wanted to. Uh, what if you could parse good old SQL into it, and then you could render from that back into good old SQL. So in a sense, I just want to use Haskell to programmatically go nuts on the on the query definition, and then I just want to call render on it and get a get a full you know SQL statement out. Um, and then what if we could express not just one query at a time, but we could express a whole network of tables that are kind of created and refreshed this way. Right, so now it's starting to feel, I guess, I mean, it's basically a directed basic like graph, right? It's your typical workflow DAG. Um, it also feels a little bit like FRP because in some sense, like every table is almost like, I mean, I guess it depends on how you see it, but it's a little bit like a behavior, I guess, in, in some of the FRP frameworks where, you know, it has sort of, sort of a certain value, but once it updates, then you, you want to propagate that update to its children and so on. So it has that, has that feel to it. Um, what if while we, we were at it, what if we did all the orchestration on the pipeline refresh? So um, just get that out of the way too. So you could just call napkin and it would just kind of handle all the data refresh for you. Well, and then here's where it gets sort of fancy because um, remember that we have full Haskell at our disposal. So we can now programmatically say, why don't I rename all my tables? I want to prefix my tables. I want to suffix my tables. I want to, you know, rename only some of the tables. All these manipulations are now super easy to do. They're not even fancy. They're just good old Haskell 98 or Haskell 2010 and with some generic data traversals. You know, that's that's basically it. Um, let's make in some idea of data units and integration tests. So make it so that every time a table gets refreshed, a bunch of like quality checks automatically run on them. So you know, if, if somebody ever breaks something in the input data or the design of the data set, um, well, you notice it right away. Um, and then, you know, here now we're getting like really uh, fancier, which is, well, let's also support multi-operation tables. So it's not just, here's a query that defines a table, but what if you could encapsulate as an operation, you know, delete the last seven days of data in a table, um, go, you know, query some other table. Actually, it's, it's different. Go query another table, create a temporary table with the last seven days, then um, atomically basically delete the data um, you know, in the destination table from the last seven days and input the temporary table into it, clean the temporary table, do some swaps, make it as atomic as possible, even though sometimes it's not perfect. Um, but sort of get this ability to do fancier operations, right? Maybe you can, for example, I give you a table, you give me a table that has a delta in time traveling encoding version of that table so that I can actually, so it's only a write, -on, it's a write only table but I can go back in time to say, what did the data look like, you know, 10 days ago? I mean, these are <clears throat> nothing rocket science-y about this. It's just basic operations. But having a framework that can do that while remaining fully analyzable and introspectable was kind of the cool thing that um, I'll talk about in a second that, that Haskell really gave us a leg up on. Um, anyways, ultimately, Napkin was born uh, 2015. We've used it a ton in production since then. Um, and just about a year ago, we finally had the idea that, well, hang on, you know, we use this a lot. We should probably do more with it. You know, maybe we can put it out there and have more people use it. Um, it would be really fun, a contribution to the data science um, ecosystem. Uh, but also, yeah, it might even be a gateway into Haskell because, um, you know, Napkin tries to hide that it's based on Haskell. But there is like this power user section. If you know Haskell, you can do a lot more with it. All right. So, um, I'll walk through some a couple of philosophical choices that might be um, you know, perhaps interesting to, to folks. So probably the earliest decision we made was to keep its types extremely simple uh, in the core layer. So I had previously spent a lot of time, uh, like many others in the Haskell community, um, you know, very heavily typing database interacting frameworks. Right. I mean, today there are very good ones that really do work really well, um, like Beam, Opali, um, you know, many others that 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 I could recall if I tried to. Um, and these things are great, but they are, you know, first of all, when I tried to do things like that, I had the following challenge. So because maybe we work in a, you know, very data science -y sort of environment in our world, they, data sets are both very varied. They're also very large. They have a lot of columns. And they change a lot and you get new ones all the time. So if you get into the business of being very careful with your type, 
steps, it really slows you down by like a factor of five. In fact, to the point where your team just doesn't want to do it, that they would rather just write totally untyped SQL than to deal with that level of sort of type complexity. Um, <clears throat> and the other thing is, if you want to maintain a higher degree of like agility, like as if you're working in Python or something, well, that's like years of research. Like how do you make Haskell types into that level convenient? Um, and others have managed this a lot better, but I just couldn't find a good enough solution. I spent a lot of time, you know, years before napkin, um, you know, and I just couldn't do it. You know, maybe with more dedicated time, more research, you could get there. But in napkin's case, we kept it super simple. The idea is napkin should look and feel like pretty much 95% of your typical SQL backends. Um, and it should be, there should be no surprises. So a SQL query, great. It's just a Haskell record, right, on the left with, you know, has a with statement, you know, has a bunch of selections, has a from, has a where, has a group, has an order, nothing fancy about it. So that once it's expressed, you could just use basic Haskell, you know, record uh, selectors and accessors to modify things on it or use lenses if that's your thing. Um, so that was choice number one. And as you can see on the right, so left is, you know, what represents a query, uh, a SQL query. And then on the right is basically what represents a column in SQL, right? What you could call an expression. So that also was very straightforward. It could be a literal, it could be a variable, you know, it could be an array. And now some of these modern fancier databases have more complex composite types. So we tried to uh, support that over time. You know, it can be a case expression, right? It could be an external function call um, and things like that. And <clears throat> distinctly, we also made one other philosophical choice, which I actually really care about. And I, I'm sorry to keep inserting this, but when I run into a library that hides its internal modules from me, I absolutely hate it. If I really don't need the library, I literally stop using it because I hate this gatekeeping of um, there's something I need to do as a power user. And you're literally preventing me from doing that in the name of hiding your interface. You should always let me. So Napkin has this philosophy of, look, we'll give you the nice way to do things. But if you literally cannot manage it using Napkin, here's an escape hatch. So you can actually jam in raw queries, and this is sort of user beware, right? You could really fail at this thing, but it is possible. You know, we're never going to make things impossible to do for you. Um, and in fact, we even had a, had a native ASD um, escape hatch. Um, so for example, if you're using a database like Postgres, and there's a, let's say, native Postgres parser that has all kinds of fancy features that other databases don't support, great. You can actually you know, skip napkins, parser, and AST, and drop directly into the native uh, native sort of parser. Um, okay, next up, we gave it a monadic interface. So again, the presumption here is that you really know SQL. You know, you're not, you know, we're not trying to teach you SQL. We're not trying to hide SQL from you. The presumption is that you already are fairly good at SQL. It's just that you would like to do it in Haskell so you can manipulate things. Um, but, and if you squint, that's how it sort of looks, right? So you can do from, you know, here's a, you can do a from a table-like thing. Uh, you do a where, a predicate-like thing. Um, you know, some conveniences, like this is very common if you write out a, a lot of SQL, uh, you'll hate it over time. The fact that SQL forces you to select something only to then group by the same thing. Like what the hell, you know, it, that repetition drives you crazy. Um, so, so we have some combinators to, you know, both select by the thing and then group by the thing in one shot. And then here's the beautiful part. Because you're in Haskell, and because this interface is basically a, what I guess what you could call the deep embedding of SQL on Haskell, um, well, you can just do al arbitrary algebra, right? So you could make expressions, make bigger expressions from those, get bigger expressions from those. You can have all kinds of intermediate variables. All of this is, is, is Haskell. And ultimately, when it's later rendered, it gets fully expanded into normal form, right? So it doesn't do anything fancy. It just fully expands it. And you get this gigantic SQL query <laughs> at the at the output layer, um, and so you know here's again an example. Trying not to betray anything too uh, too confidential, but wanted to give a real example. Um, so you can um, <clears throat> basically do arbitrary things in this, and it all renders to nice SQL. Um, I say nice; it actually doesn't look that great, and we need to improve this. <laughs> but um, ultimately, it renders into correct SQL. Let's say. Um, but you know, certainly uh, its formatting can use some help. But you'll notice a few things. You know, here, for example, you, you never see anything about like safe divisions. You know, there's nothing, you know, if you're a professional analytics person, 
you'll find yourself writing SQL that'll do things like, well, safe divide by, because if the denominator is zero, you don't want the thing to blow up and make your calculation incorrect. So you'll, you'll guard against all these edge cases. Well, the nice thing is, you know, in, in Napkin, because we're using Haskell, well, you can have these individual like combinators bake in such protections. So once you get used to them, you don't have to think about them anymore. Yet when they're rendered, you'll notice that there's these like safety divides all over the place and some like predicates that, you know, do certain value checks and so on. So in a sense, you can get rid of all the annoying parts of SQL, just write the nice looking one and then have Napkin generated for you um, and it all sort of works. Okay, so a couple more um, layers up the hierarchy. Um, and by the way, if there's ever any questions, please just uh, you know write them in uh, you know in chat or something like that, and I'm and I'm happy to uh, find a way to incorporate them into 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 my talk here. Um, but so if we think about the abstractions here, there's there's something like three steps you wanna uh, you wanna be able to do in practical use of this. Well, first, ideally, we give you a nice way to define one query. Right. So whether you want to write it in good old fashioned SQL and then parse it into Napkin, or whether you want to use Napkin's DSL to write it in Haskell that looks like SQL, but then you know it gives you all the additional power. So that's step one. We kind of give you a way to express a query. And then the next layer up is now we need to give you a way to have arbitrary database interacting programs, right? So you know, send the query, look at the response, decide something, send the next query, look at the response, decide something. So, or maybe ask the database for the schema of a data set because maybe you'll act differently based on the schema of the data set, right? So we need to give you the next layer of abstraction. And then once you have that ability, now we need to give you the final layer of abstraction, which is sort of like this full DAG network where you can express, all right, I'm doing a project or I've got a product that spits out a bunch of data and I want my product to have a dashboard functionality, but a bunch of transformations need to happen to support the dashboard. Um, great. I can, I'm going to express the whole thing as this full bag. Now I have a super tidy way to say, refresh everything, boom, and it just, it just propagates all the way. Um, so let's talk about the next layer up the chain of abstraction, the second step, the database interacting programs. So here, um, I, I think we have another interesting case, um, which in our case, it's sort of the free monad idea again, uh, funny enough, without trying, uh, I think we <laughs> stumbled back into our, you know, whatever, 2014 ideas. But this time we decided to use polysemy. Um, to be honest, you might say why polysemy and, and not something else. And the answer is, you know, we were a little uh, sort of, um, I guess, familiar with it already and it was comfortable. And, uh, and this is a use case that actually doesn't have to worry too much about um, performance. Um, yeah, I know Polysemy had you know, some back and forth about performance that I'm not even super up to speed with. But for us, the key requirement was we wanted to be able to define pretty clearly the operations you could do against the database or in napkin circumstances and have full introspection power. So that was the point for us because we needed to be able to take this thing, um, you know, let the user write it, but then dry run it. But not only that, basically analyze it without running it so that we could say, oh, what are the tables they're using? What are the queries they're issuing? And what are the tables those queries um, are using? Um, are they doing any destructive operations? Is it all read operations? Do they do any renames? So we basically Napkin's broader functionality really wanted to be able to understand before things happened, what was going to happen against the database. And so again, the effect systems make this pretty nice. Um, I wouldn't claim that this is the only way to do it. There's probably other ways to do it, but, but we could make it work pretty nicely this way. Um, and, it's, and it's been working pretty well. So to give you an idea, all the things you see on the left are um, what you could call effects that Napkin uh, exposes, right? So in some sense, these are things you can do against databases. So ballpark, right, you can do assertions. Um, there are some backend specific capabilities. Um, you know, you can load queries, um, you can load a local file, you can log something, you can recreate, essentially, that's like a special workflow, you can parse SQL, you can, you know, set, read SQL, uh, most importantly, you can do SQL, like read and write operations. And that, that's actually a good example. So that's what we're expanding here. So the SQL write operation to give you a really tangible idea, you know, it can do basically most things you might imagine. Uh, a database interacting tool needs to be able to do. So it can uh, you know, create a table from a query definition. It can 
you know, create a view from a query definition. You can insert into a um, insert into a table um, based on the results from a query. You can update a table, rename a table, copy drop view, uh, copy drop table or view, um, and, and and delete from a table. Right. In the future, we might add more to it, but in some sense, these are all the all the things um, um, that you can do. Um, you know, basically using napkin. Um, and just as I say that, I actually saw a question. So let me divert with that. So the question is, using this tool, would it be possible to automatically migrate columns from using sequential IDs to UUID? Um, honestly, it depends on your specific circumstances and we'd have to look, but yeah, I mean, as a general um, thought, I don't see why not. Um, ultimately, uh, you would basically, you, you would have your way of doing a couple different ways, right? You could say, I'm going to keep the source table intact, but I'm going to create a new table that is like the source table, but instead it has UUID swapped in for the ID column. So it's basically just a full table transform. That's easy. Um, what I think we try not to do with Napkin's workflows is literally do mutating operations on a table. Um, so you might be able to do it, but um, um, you know, I, I think it depends a little bit on the, the architecture you'd like to support. How would Napkin compare to something like Spark uh, SQL? Um, good question. I think I would need to. I think I would need to think about that specifically to answer. It's been a while uh, since I used uh, Spark SQL directly. I think there are certainly other circumstances, and and I think even Microsoft has some solutions for this. I think it was Link, if I remember correctly. You know that that try to help you dynamically program uh, SQL to some extent. I think maybe a few things to mention here. One, NAC is designed so that you really lean on the underlying databases capability. So in some sense, if you do something in Napkin, you're quite free. Like you can you can start by doing it in SQLite, then you can upgrade to something like Postgres. But your data set has to be super small for this though. So we're talking about toy problems. And then the second your data set, data, uh, data set gets large, you're like, okay, let me now start using BigQuery or Snowflake or something like that, or Redshift, right? And then so you're very portable, I would say, in your backend chain. And then the whole thing, especially if you're a Haskeller, um, the whole thing remains very, like, you can modify and go nuts with what you're able to do. Um, in fact, we haven't looked into it, but I think we should probably even have a Spark backend for Napkin at some point so that you can use Napkin, but the thing actually runs on Spark. But I think it needs a little bit more, um, little bit more investigation. Um, okay, let me see. I think there's an addition to that note. Does the DB interpretation of a pipeline build up large nested query and let the database optimize once or materialize intermediate data and handle optimizations across the queries itself? So interesting, both actually, and that's sort of the fun part. So with Napkin, what we tend to do is, um, and so Napkin itself is super flexible in those two axes. You can make one query crazy complex. I actually have a fun example later. We literally have a million character SQL query that BigQuery just like just gets done in like minutes on billion uh, row data sets, which is fascinating. Um, so you can you can try to really push how much you can pack into one table refresh. But then let's say that just doesn't work. You hit a limit. You want to materialize intermediate tables. Great, Napkin makes that super easy, and that's where the DAG part comes in, right? You you design your your full DAG, and you know Napkin see into all of it, right? You can see dependency chains automatically. I'll show you in a second, but both both patterns um, are are pretty clear. Um, okay, I'll keep moving. I think the question on Spark is interesting. Uh, that's a little bit of maybe a homework for us. Uh, I'm intrigued. I, we need to look into it more. Uh, have a good contrast with how it differs from Spark today. It's been years since I looked into Spark. I think. My intuition, they, they might have improved things. So I don't want to say something uh, bad there. Um, OK, so you know, just to give you a bit more of, of this sort of multi-operation idea, again, this will be interesting to Haskellers. Um, you know, because we have this effect system, even if you do something like, hey, I want to I have an incrementally inserted table where by primary key, every time I run it, I'm only going to look into the last seven days. And then I'm only going to update my thing on the last seven days. Um, but you know, there's going to be some nuance on there's a primary key. So look in the last seven days, find the new primary keys that got introduced that I didn't have before and remove all the primary keys that went away. So you can do all this, right? Uh, and the cool thing is this is a pretty complex multi-chain operation. And, and the technical challenge for us was how do we do this? And we can still um, have full introspection power into the underlying query. So 
I want to be able to see that, oh, you use this table, and then there's like literally an if statement that's that's shallow embedded in Haskell. So it's under the Lambda. I can't see into it really. Um, but I need to be able to see in each branch, like which, like what, what do you sort of use? So we did some actually clever tricks here because the effects are under our control. We did things like, well, it just so happens that when you use the check table exists sort of interpret, uh, sort of effect, you know, our interpreter layer is clever enough to say, okay, under a dry run analysis, I know that that could return true. That could also return false. So I'm going to try it both ways and then see what your program ends up using. So we have a pretty good idea of your full dependency chain and things like that. So we have some hacks like this. The, the ultimate problem is kind of impossible to do. I mean, it's again, um, uh, like irreducible or whatever you call it, NP complete, I guess. Um, but, um, but we have some heuristics that, that get, us, get us there pretty, pretty efficiently. Um, okay, um, new question, let me see. Will there be support for other database languages like Cypher used in EO4j, joinless SQL used in Scylla Cassandra? Hmm, interesting. I would say um, it's not currently on our immediate roadmap, but fundamentally, um, I don't see why not. I think it's worth thinking about. I mean, especially the, the Neo4j example is pretty intriguing to me personally because graph Graph um, analyses come up a lot in data science workflows, and it might be very cool if we had a way, like we for us, in fact, Napkin's pretty actually polymorphic about, uh, at least nowadays, about the dialect of SQL that it uses. So it can even say it has the concept of, a, I'm gonna use the Napkin's own SQL representation versus native Postgres versus native SQLite and so on. So with a little bit more of a refactor, I don't see why we couldn't say, well, actually it's not about SQL per se, but you know, we just need a way to speak to the database. And so we could start speaking totally different um, query, um, I think, dialects. But to be blunt about it, it's not immediately something we've been planning, but it's an intriguing thought, maybe homework number two to, 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 to think about it. Um, all right, so I think I'll, I'll keep going. Um, so just to give you an idea, we, we baked in a bunch of these more advanced operations that, you know, if you use Napkin, you can start using right away. So we have some cool things. Like what if you make a query you know, because you programmatically generate these, you tend to have massive queries. And also to the earlier question, what if you have a query that has like literally 200 union statements? Um, and what if, um, well, and then you send this to BigQuery and BigQuery says, query too large, I can't run this. You're like, okay, I got to break this into pieces. So for example, we created a sort of an analyzing, uh, you know, basically an analyzing optimizer, if you want to think of it that way, you give it a fully baked massive sort of table refresh program. Um, it will go sift through it, detect queries, and then it's find where it'll find where the top level unions are happening, and it'll like split them into pieces. So it might turn a 200 union into like basically something like 20 incrementally inserting union interactions, each one containing I don't know five or something, five unions. So it can do this automatically, and that's that's kind of the really fun part of this. You, it makes your your SQL pipeline fully introspectable and modifiable on, on the fly. And then we have a bunch of other combinators baked in. And the cool thing is all of these are implemented just using the, um, the, the effects layer. So there's nothing fancy in this. As the end user, you can invent your own ways of doing incremental insert um, and it would just work fine. It would just use the effects layer that Napkin exposes. Okay, all right. So now I'll move on to um, sort of the final layer um, uh, in, in the sort of chain of abstraction. Um, which is sort of this, you know, DAGs portion, you know, orchestrating the whole pipeline. You know, to the earlier question, you know, you can make each each table super complex, but at some point you can't just have one table. You need to have multiple tables uh, relying on each other. Um, so here's what Napkin is able to do. Uh, let's say you, let's say you, when you start, you don't want to learn Napkin's DSL, um, and you just want to write SQL because you're used to it, you're familiar with it. Um, so you just do Napkin in it. It starts a new project structure for you. And then there's a SQL folder there. You just start throwing in SQL statements there, right? You just, you, you imagine in your head, okay, I'm going to have a table that does this. Then I'm going to have another table that uses the first one and the original data set. It'll keep going from there. Um, and, then, uh, and, then, and then basically, um, then you say to Napkin, hey, could you just infer the initial, uh, what we call the spec file, where... You, as the data scientist or analyst, you, you get to define your kind of choices and options for each table. It actually goes in there, looks at all the SQL files because it can analyze SQL. It figures out cross dependencies, builds a DAG out of it, 
and then it infers a starting point YAML file for you. And again, YAML, because we don't want to scare non-Haskellers. Um, honestly, um, I think probably in the future, we could have a doll version of this. Um, and, and certainly there's a Haskell version of this too, where you can actually express your spec as a monadic Haskell value. So if you're, a, you know, if you're an actual Haskell team, you don't need to use the YAML file at all. Um, there was like a Haskell entry point to this. Um, but we made a YAML version because, again, we don't want to scare um, non-Haskell communities. Um, but it infers all of this automatically for you. And because it sees into dependencies, you never have to define them. So you just say, you know, for, you pick any, for example, sales by country table. You just say, okay, I want it to be created based on this SQL file. By the way, after you run it, you know, please perform some assertions for me. I want to make sure that I'm unique by country, that, you know, I better have less than 20. 20, right? And we can actually get super fancy with these things. Um, you can have some pre-hooks for quality control, quality checks. Uh, and ultimately, you know, and then by the way, you can get your DAG too. So, you know, eyeballing the DAG is super helpful. Uh, you know, it might point at typos you may have made and so on. Um, so we spent a lot of time on these, on these cosmetics. Um, another thing that's really useful as part of that is uh, Napkin has a GHC, GHC ID style validating loop. So you basically say, like napkin validate dash interactive or dash i. Um, and then what it does is it literally scans your entire project all the time, very GHCID style. And then as you modify any SQL file uh, or as you modify any Haskell file even, <laughs> uh, which by the way, it has a Haskell interpreter in it. So there are some hacks there. So we, we can even live interpret Haskell files and we did some hacks to make that fast enough because on very large pipelines, it would take literally a minute um, and an effort was put in by our team to get it down to seconds again. Um, we do some caching and things like that. Um, but it's, this is super helpful. So you, you basically get into this like validator loop and then you work on your pipeline as you make little edits on your SQL file. Um, you get sort of this live check on whether, whether the whole thing clicks together reasonably um, ac across the board. And so, something really cool, by the way, is because, because Napkin can see into your SQL files, um, you never have to pollute your SQL with like weird um, artifacts from the framework. So for example, um, you know, Napkin has, you know, certainly there are other tools out there that are even very different from Napkin that have the same idea. Well, let's make SQL a little more programmable. What they'll do is they'll have you insert special characters or special variable references and so on in SQL. Whereas in our world, we don't have to do that because we can actually read your SQL and understand how these things are connected. So you just write SQL like you would otherwise. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and then ultimately, Napkin itself is just, a, is just an executable. So we package all it up as a Napkin, the command line program. And, um, you know, it, it's, it has lots and lots of features. So, you know, everywhere from Napkin init to Napkin validate to it has a REPL, by the way. You can do Napkin REPL and drop into just to make interaction. It's basically GHCI, but with Napkin stuff loaded in. Um, so you can, you can use some convenience functions easily. Um, you can run the pipeline. There's like a nice progress bar showing you how it's all running. Of course, it follows maximal parallelism. So it figures out the DAG. Um, this is where Haskell has been super nice. I mean, literally day one of the napkin pre-prototype already had insanely good execution powers because you just, you know, basically async or fork IO a bunch of threads and just do some co-coordination. Super nice. I mean, things that would be much more difficult in other languages came easy, literally day like five of this project. Um, and then a lot of a lot of effort actually went into making this DAG part convenient. So you can do things like, you know, hey, I want you to run the whole thing, or I want you to run everything except anything that starts with this keyword, or I want you to disable the whole pipeline. I want you to just force this table, and then I want you to follow all of its children all the way through. So as you're like doing your, your pipeline um, development, it's very, very easy to rapid fire. Okay, I just made a tweak on this on this table, run that and everything that depends on it in one shot. And then you just type in a few commands, very um, intuitive, and then it just gets done. Um, really, really convenient. And today, by the way, the way you deploy this is also actually fairly straightforward. You just, um, it's just an executable. So you can, you can deploy it all the way from a cron job to a you know, an ECS task or something if you're using uh, using Amazon. Now, we want to make that part a little bit better, but the core capability is so, you know, self-contained that there's really no magic to even deploying this. Uh, it just remains very easy. Um, all right, so I'm about to close in a little bit. 
Um, but just to give you guys, um, you know, an example of the, some of the, I mean, we've done a lot of crazy things with this, but I think one of the, one of the proud moments. So in our work, we have some proprietary machine learning algorithms we wrote. And in one such example, the algorithm itself is actually in Python, but it exports a, a, a JSON payload, which is regular enough that you can read into Haskell. So we wrote the Haskell types and parser for it. So literally Haskell can do predictions, even though you do the training in Python, uh, perhaps a little weird, but worked out that way. Um, well, here was the idea. Because this is a tree-based algorithm, what if we wrote an interpreter for the prediction in Napkin as SQL so that um, this custom algorithm we had could batch predict through BigQuery? And the problem was we have these multi-billion row data sets. And if you try to like, let's say you try to predict this in, in Haskell or Python, I mean, this will take days and you'll you'll need to boot lots of servers and coordinate. I mean, it's you don't even do it. You usually just subsample and then you just predict it for a million and hope that the results are the same. Um, well, the cool thing is you can actually write, and I'm not showing the body of the function, but I'm giving you the type signature. So you can see, you know, here's where the model file is. You know, the model, you know, here's the types about the model. You kind of teach it how to render the columns a little bit. Um, and then you give it a destination table. That's what this ref is. It's a reference to a table. Um, and then boom, it gives you a query. Literally, it's a SQL query such that if you run it, it predicts on a billion rows. Um, so this thing actually renders into, depending on how big the model is, anywhere from 500,000 to a, up to a million character SQL uh, query. By the way, why up to a million? Well, this is also how we discovered that BigQuery won't run things that are greater than a million characters. Um, so there's some model complexity currently. <laughs> and we're also thinking about ways to like maybe we can do more common expression elimination to pack it even more efficiently. So bigger, bigger models can actually still fit in that million sort of quota. Um, but um, this is literally how it, how it looks. So we can, um, we can have it do some, some pretty crazy things for us. Um, all right, so closing, uh, I think closing slide. Um, we've actually been using this for uh, something like six years, all the way from its early uh, post-prototype stages to you know, it's, it's more maturity these days. Um, it's really hard to estimate, but I think very conservatively, we can say you know, it's, un, it's managing over 100 billion rows, mostly on BigQuery these days, although Postgres and Redshift and SQLite are also supported. Um, our biggest implementation of it has more than 3,000 tables under management, so uh, certainly no joke. Um, Honestly, the, the sort of fun part, what we're trying to achieve here is to, you know, see if this would get some traction in the broader community. We use it a lot, certainly. Um, and then, um, you know, we definitely do a lot more. So I think there are some avenues for moving forward with uh, doing supporting automated analysis, better data quality checks and governance. Um, again, Napkin's maybe powers against other frameworks is its, is its willingness to understand SQL. Whereas most other solutions are more like framework or sorry, workflow managers that, um, you know, that just see SQL as a sort of a side uh, on the side sort of uh, detail. Um, so I think there's probably a lot we can do there. Um, we're contemplating going full open source with this. So currently the tool is free, but we're hiding the source code. Um, I think there might be a value to open source, but we just need the licensing right. So um, it, it clicks with our rest of our plans. Uh, to be honest, though, Napkin will always be free. So that's we're putting it out there for free, whether the source itself is visible or not. Um, it will be free. Um, and then we, like I said, we are thinking about maybe we can do a web app on top of this that could really add some interesting um, additional value. All right, that's about it. Um, with that, um, thanks for listening. I'll open up for questions. I see that a question just came in. So let me maybe hit that immediately. Um, so does Napkin have native app and silicon binary executables for my development workflow? And the answer is, I really want to say, yes, it very much works on Apple's new M1 computers because some of us actually have that. Um, I am trying to remember if that happens through an actual na native binary or the Rosetta uh, emulation thing, but it 100% works. In fact, the machine I'm presenting on is M1. Um, if you go to docs.napkin.run, we spent quite a bit of time. There's actually a, a sample starter project that's open on GitLab. You can just git clone it. If you use VS Code, you can drop into a dev container. Literally within seconds, it'll just come preloaded everything. Napkin will be in there. An example data set will be in there. You can just follow the tutorial, click around in the code base. It, it just works. Um, and it, it works on this machine. So 
you know, through Docker it works. The binary installer should work for M1. Um, but I would have to ask one of my colleagues uh, to remember if we solved the native binary problem yet or are we doing through Rosetta? Um, but maybe that's a minor detail. It works either way. All right, any other uh, questions? Give it a few seconds for the Twitch delay. Yeah, well, I guess we, we ended up fielding some of the questions in line, so maybe there isn't much left, but <laughs> just in case. Oz, thank you so much for a great talk. A lot of us have to deal with SQL day in, day out, so it's great to see another tool that, uh, that we, can, we can use. So really thank you for doing yeah. the talk today. My, my pleasure. And let me, if you don't mind, let me just insert. Um, so we are going to be pretty community uh, open and driven on this. So we already have a Slack channel for it. So if you go to our website, go to community, you'll see the, the Slack channel. Um, actually, the matrix is a, uh, is a fun idea. We might end up creating a matrix channel as well for this. Um, <laughs> you know, just got introduced to it as part of this talk. Um, so if you have any questions, come ask us. Um, you know, if you have ideas for collaboration, we're totally um, open to that as well. Um, and finally, um, we do a lot of this kind of work at Sue Stone, um, not to be cheesy about it, but we're always on the lookout for uh, fun colleagues to add to our team. Uh, you know, these days we're actually are actively recruiting as well. So if you think that there might be some kind of uh, an overlap there, just hit us up. Um, pretty much anyone at Sue Stone would be a good entry point, but you can, you can just directly uh, reach me as well. Um, and, uh, you know, we can talk. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much to both of our speakers. Really appreciate it. Uh, I am working on another event for May stroke June. I'll announce it on Meetup uh, as soon as I can. And if everyone can visit sfhaskell.com, you'll see we have links to our YouTube channel and our peer YouTube channel. Recordings of today's uh, talks will be on there. I'll announce it on the on Twitter when it is. And um, yeah, the, the, other, other than that, uh, Thank you all for taking the time to attend today. Thank you to our speakers, attendees. Thank you, Ryan, for help mo mo moderate the event, help me to moderate the event as well. And have a great Easter weekend, everyone. Thanks all.